Hello, everybody, and welcome to the um, panel session organized by Great Green Action and Air Impact at uh, COP28. And um, today we are discussing on the pro project level, uh, we will introduce uh, three different projects. Uh, we are addressing some of the challenges, uh, what the projects are facing, and then discussing also that how do we solve those challenges um, so that we can scale scale the number of projects and uh, make everybody successful. Um, today we have in this panel, we have uh, uh, Mikkel Menekon from Pumps Foundation. And then we have uh, Dave Rose uh, from uh, Carbon Click. Welcome. And uh, Anette Carosa from uh, One MTN. And then uh, Damien Kuhn from uh, Terraformation. Welcome. Okay. Um, so in the beginning, um, we'll start by going through every project uh, and uh, uh, the, the responsible person who is um, involved in the project will be uh, explaining how the project is working and uh, giving more introduction about the project. So, so um, Damien, if you want to start with the, with the project, what you are developing. Thank you. Good. Yeah, thank you. And my name is Damien Kuhn. Um, I'm a forester, vice president of Ter Terraformation. Um, a few words about Terraformation. Um, we are uh, restoring native biodiverse uh, forest in the tropics. Uh, we set up an accelerator, the seed to car for carbon forest accelerator, for the forestry team on the ground to get access to uh, capacity building, to uh, seed banks, one of our products um, to a software that we developed called TerraWare for project management and monitoring of the project and to uh, the carbon funding. And this the fourth solution we bring through the accelerator. Uh, we run uh, already two courts. Uh, I'm going to speak about one project of the first court in Ghana, but just to let you know that we went with the first court, we run project in Ghana, Kenya, and Colombia, and the second court of our accelerator was uh, and is focused on the Indonesia and the Philippines. And we are preparing the third court in, uh, in Africa again. The project I want to talk to you about is a mangrove restoration project in the Keta Lagoon in, uh, in uh, Ghana. This is where this is a delta of the Volta River. And we are working with uh, our local partners is Siwata Solution, working with four communities to restore uh, wetlands over there. And um, the we are it's it's a two two thousand six hundred uh, hectares of mangrove restoration, uh, using mainly three three main species of of mangrove over, over there, and we are at the stage that this project is at the funding stage. It means that we did all the capacity building and um, a feasibility study. We developed the project document that is now submitted to Vera for the carbon certification. And uh, we are um, on the FPIC, man, means uh, stakeholder engagement of uh, of uh, the the four surrounding uh, communities. This is a, a, a big uh, piece. This uh, a community engagement because it's where we are, of course, speaking about the the benefit of the project, how community will have short, mid, and long term benefit of of the activities uh, of the projects. And we cover not only the um, the the mangrove uh, collecting seeds uh, and uh, planting, but of course also the livelihood activities with uh, fishing uh, ponds, community-based fishing ponds, uh, to have income gen generation really uh, since the first year of the project implementation, as well as uh, honey production. It's, it's a lot of trainings for for communities, and um, as well as um, uh, creating a community trust fund for sharing uh, carbon revenue also for collective investment in the village. Thank you. Maybe over to Annette then, and to Uganda. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction previously, and thank you for having us here. Uh, as mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of 1MTN. We are restoring degradating land in Africa by planting bamboo. Currently, we are operational in uh, Uganda. Uh, we have finalized uh, 400 hectare plantation. Our project is 10,000 hectares. It's under a very new methodology. 
uh, we actually, as a project, we are um, the most important thing that we are measuring is soil health. And uh, bamboo is just a tool how we are approaching this mission on the degraded land. So meaning our mission is very, very, um, I would say important, of course, not uh, in, in the region wise. Um, our work starts uh, in the seedling nurseries. We have to make sure that the capacity is there, that the high quality standards are there, that really the seedling material is is uh, on a good quality so it can solve our needs on a field really to be, be a very healthy plantation. Uh, as we are using native species, uh, we have invested a lot into the digital solutions. We are coming from Estonia, which is a very digital country. And uh, we want to use these digital tools for us to help uh, uh, get inside understanding which bamboo species in which particular area are the best. We have our limitations because we are using only native species, as I mentioned before. So we have to actually bring this knowledge together with the capacity in, the, in the Uganda. And uh, that takes a lot of uh, work as well from us as a project developer to really ensure this high quality of the seedling material. And definitely this is the capacity building and also knowledge for the local people uh, because we are not having our own nurseries. We are pre-investing, pre-purchasing seedlings from the local nurseries. That's the way how we can create a bigger impact. And uh, yes, then uh, we are planting bamboo with the mosaic approach, also implementing biodiversity monitoring um, practices. We are very, very happy about our teams doing on the grounds. Uh, for example, intercropping, uh, also leaving biodiversity sites, uh, planting uh, flourishing trees. Uh, and uh, together with the local partners, uh, we truly believe that uh, by the partnership with the local universities, using this local knowledge, we can build up the project with the very high quality data, measurable data, the, the one. Uh, and um, and uh, yes, so um, I'm very happy about how we are, uh, how we are doing um, our project design together with the local partners and also with Air Impact's help, we can be more um, successful in, in, the, in the area of reporting really high quality data to the end buyer because we are here promoting high quality projects which are trustable, accessible for everybody. So yes, that's about it. Uh, so, shortly, Annette, when, when, when did you start the project? So uh, all projects started uh, this year in, uh, in, uh, in April. Uganda is lucky they have two planting seasons. We just finalized in September the second planting season. This is our first operational year and uh, we are scaling up in the upcoming years. Uh, because we need to build the capacity of the seedling material as well along the way. As bamboo is sustainable timber, uh, it's actually a very great tool for uh, economic impact as well in the region, uh, where actually the jobs and also educational access to education, there are lit a lot of things where the local communities are fighting. So we see that actually bamboo as this tool can create a much bigger value than only from the environmental perspective, but also for the impact for the communities. Yes. Thank you. And uh, Dave, um, let's first go to Michele, uh, and then we'll go to Carbon Click, and you can explain us what is Carbon Click. But first, um, Michele, if you can explain what is um, what kind of project you are developing in uh, in Guru Mountains. Hello, everybody. And um, we are um, developing a project in one uh, close to one of the Eastern Arc Mountains, which is a chain of 13 mountain blocks in Tanzania, a very ancient chain of mountains with very ancient forest, uh, relatively small in size, but among the richest forests of Africa, in especially in terms of endemic species. Uh, so we see these forests as little jewels and um, uh, because the biodiversity is outstanding. And in the last three, four hundred years, it has been calculated that probably between 70 and 85 percent of the forest cover are being, are being cleared. And uh, what we are trying to do is, in collaboration with the local communities, to bring part of this forest back. Um, we have selected that place for 
specific reason because is um, uh, farmland is a subsistence farming is very close to the natural forest to protected areas and um, it's at the right elevation the villages are closed so it means that the people who come to work in the project they just walk into the project so there's no need to move people to different places uh, is their land and they know the forest very well with all the issues related you know there's poaching illegal logging encroachment which of course are driven by necessity so and of course we see uh, the carbon now now the project is in his way to registration so so far is a tree planting project mm -hmm. and we have started about a year and a half ago but we see uh, the carbon market just as a tool i mean the place where the money comes from and maybe there will be more tools in the future uh, we try to have like an holistic approach basically all these people i mean the the, the community we work with are just just an example of many communities in the world they have seen trees you know acquiring value after being cut because you can sell the planks and the wood so is the, the attempt is actually to turn this into uh, a new paradigm so the trees are actually valuable when they stand when they are alive means also understanding the role of the trees and the role of the trees also in in restoring biodiversity means the role of biodiversity and of course a good thing of this project both a challenge and a good thing is that they last last very long so you can plan your action over a long period of time um the way the project works very briefly is by uh is completely run by tanzanians both the staff running the project and the communities um we use only indigenous species and as much as possible through seed collected just in, a, in the nearby forest. Also because all the Eastern Arc Mountains forests are kind of unique as a chain, but they are unique All each single forest fragment has been separated from the other by millions of years. It means that the tree, even if the species name is the same from one mountain as a a, you know, a certain degree of genetic distance from the same tree coming from another mountain. And there's a lot of local endemics. So we basically, uh, we collect the trees on site, the seeds on site. And, uh, and the idea is to reach about 120 different tree species to restore the original forest, actually to, to trigger the restoration because the forest itself will restore um and to create a mosaic of different land uses because of course it must accommodate the the, the restored forest is biodiversity farming activities for uh, food security and of course over 40 years a changing society a changing situation so we are trying to have an holistic approach and try to accommodate all these variables okay thank you michael and uh, now dave um Maybe you could tell us about Carbon Click and uh, also explain that how do you work with the, with the carbon markets and uh, with the projects. Thank you. So uh, Carbon Click, we're born out of New Zealand, uh, originally as a spin-off out of the airlines as a tech company. Um, our founders built the little button that you can see that now a lot of airlines use where you can offset that flight um, and the calculations and... Um, and placement of carbon behind that. But what we've really become from there is a, a carbon platform uh, with our own audit methodology. So we're buying um, and looking for the best projects all around the world that are certified already. And what we're doing is we're then re-auditing them against our methodology because there are a lot of cracks in the different methodologies, even gold standard, um, which is the best. Uh, there are flaws in there and bad projects end up making it through the system. Not, not necessarily really bad, but potentially overinflated, um, potentially lacking permanence, potentially lacking um, additionality. Uh, and what we're looking for is strong projects with good biodiversity enhancement, um, good social impact as well. Um, I like these stories about, you know, not displacing the villages and so on, but working in harmony with them. 
um, as well as obviously the carbon measurement being real and tangible. What the software platform side of things does is it tracks every donation to the, um, or every carbon purchase to the um, actual uh, project. So we can see what fees have been deducted along the way um, and how much actually ends up impacting financially um, those developing nations where we are trying to get those financial flows coming through to. And that's uh, the carbon offsetting world is broken. And I know a lot of people are trying to fix it at the moment, but this is the same stance that we came in with. Let's just do it ourselves, uh, fix fix this with our own methodology. And um, and now we work with with a lot of uh, organizations globally, airlines globally, um, from you know Formula One to Expo City Dubai here. Um, as the offset partners, and we're able to redirect the flow of funds into far more meaningful carbon offsets. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I I think it would be good to have a one more round on um, kind of uh, raising up the challenges what the projects are each project is facing at the moment, uh, just to kind of uh, give uh, everybody an understanding. Uh, how complicated and uh, challenging it is to work with the nature. So, uh, Damien, if you want to start. Uh, yeah. Good. Then let's uh, go back to Ghana in the wetlands and the mangrove. Um, uh, our partner actually started uh, one year and a half ago uh, and started uh, in one community uh, demonstrating with a, a, a pilot plantation, 20 hectares, small scales just to show concrete things uh, to, to people around. Um, I think that that was a great approach because one of the first bottleneck is a timing of, of development. And when you are speaking with uh, stakeholders, especially uh, uh, committees in the village, um, when you start the discussion, hey, we can do a, a project together, it's great. Um, they are expecting to start tomorrow. And then it's good to, to explain, ah, this is quite a long process. We need to make this feasibility study. There is this long methodology from Vera or the standard that take quite a lot of time <laughs> to, uh, to build and calculate the baseline and so on. Then uh, timing is uh, one uh, important bottleneck. And yeah, one solution we find good is sh start to show concrete things as soon as possible. Uh, for them. Um, yeah, the, the um, uh, other bottleneck, I would say, is it, it, most of the bottleneck are human related relationship. Um, it's, uh, and I will explain the other one is with the, all the stakeholder engagement. Um, we need to figure out uh, the long tenure. And uh, you have the model system, modern system, and the traditional customary system. And this takes quite a lot of time and discussion with the communities to really understand and have a good clarity on the on the long tenure system. And it's of course depends from place to place. Even in, in Ghana, where we oper operate as a project, is quite different when we are in terrestrial forest than when we are in mangrove forest. And um, this is second bottleneck. And uh, again, we need quite as a project developer sometimes to have this discussion with the head of clan, head of family, and to, to have cl clarification about the long tenure. Of course, the family, we are bringing value, as you said, uh, with, with the project, but wetland was, this is the word, it was considered mostly as waste land. Then they, the community didn't invest in a proper land title. Then we are supporting them to go up to the land survey and registration to the land commission of, of Ghana. Again, it's quite a, a long process. Bottleneck number three is mainly with the government. And uh, we, even if it's, um, um, I would say, private development project with partnership, it's private land, it's not governmental land. We are speaking about forest, we are speaking about landscape with many stakeholders involved. And then, uh, of course, the government is one big piece, um, uh, big party. And then the discussion with them are important just because there are there is many type of carbon project landscape initiative. We are focused on the bottom-up approach. Speaking with communities, building projects, government is negotiating with World Bank, with other type of more juridic, juridic, juridic approach. 
And then we have to be sure that these two types of approach are, are very aligned. And that's the third, I would say, bottleneck, um, uh, just because, again, we need a lot of discussion, explanation, and finding the right way to nest our initiative, project-based, bottom-up, into the uh, national or jurisdictional uh, approach. Um, it involves also quite a lot of technical discussion. We have to have the same monitoring approach. I will not go into this technical discussion, but it's part of the what I call alignment between the different approaches in, in one country. Thank you. And uh, Annette, uh, in your project, what has been the so far the biggest challenges and have you how have you been solving those challenges yeah so from from let's now move from ghana to uganda <laughs> but um from from our project perspective as we are talking about bamboo plantation establishment on a degraded land i actually see pretty clearly three bottlenecks first of all lack of digitalization is it e-governance e is it uh, lack of the digitalization in the land registry systems so these are the issues uh, that uh, we see that uh, could possibly if if sold uh, scale up or operationals as well because this is slowing us down and uh, we see ourselves as a uh, pioneers in the digitalizing uh, land in in northern uganda and is it uh, soil measurements afterwards is it the monitoring so uh, lack of digital digitalization in the country that's a huge issue um, that could solve a lot of uh, things for us as well. Uh, second bottleneck is definitely seedling, a lack of uh, seedlings. Uh, the capacity still is not there. Bamboo is native, but as it's not uh, commercialized in a, in a, uh, in a Uganda, it's still considered as a poor man's timber. And um, then capacity in the nurseries is not there to need needs for the for our goals. Um, and the third one is definitely access to the finance because uh, nature-based uh, um, project establishment needs enormous amount of uh, financing in the early stages to really build our knowledge, to build uh, to build a project, and also to establish infrastructure in the right way. Because everybody needs to be compensated, and we need to bring the quality and it's in, and to bring the systems to build the infrastructure. And uh, yeah, so lack of these are the three ones. And um, uh, when we continue to Mik Mikele, but then at the same time, I would um, ask Dave to start thinking that what would you like to know about this project? So just to give you a little bit time to think about it, uh, let's continue with Mikele. Um, I have to say that if I have to think to proper challenges, which are not necessarily operational, day-to-day -day activity related challenges, I, I kind of think what we are probably going to face in the future, near future and far future. So far things have been, of course, with some challenges, but the normal challenges every time you start something like this, you know, figuring out how to solve the problems that are related to the to the implementation of a project for land tenure in tanzania there is the possibility to issue uh, customary right certificates for for the land use and we went that way and uh, and of course is um, um all the ba the political buy-in the social buy-in and so on my main concern is how to deal on the long term with the communities. I, we see the communities as the central element. If the community is happy, long term, pro project will thrive long term. If the community is not happy, if something change, if the benefits are not following, you know, the changes that will happen throughout the duration of the project, there we encounter serious, uh, serious issues. Also, we talk about the project as something that we do which i mean is partly true uh, but we are actually modifying a local setting we are actually introducing new variables in a, in a situation that would have evolved differently you know in 40 years the duration of the project and i think we have to be extremely cautious in understanding what these variables are going to produce and you know 
And it's not a matter of being able to pay the community. That's just almost a technical thing. I mean, I mean, from a financial perspective, we have we have to make sure that we will always have the money to pay to pay the community. But the benefits for the community, they're not just economical. I mean, we have to kind of figure out how to co, uh, uh, let's say, to contribute, I mean, to cooperate with them throughout the long term, I mean, to find the right path where the value of trees, the value of biodiversity, the value of the land that has been always, you know, uh, a place where to cultivate and, and get food, basically, will change over time. And also the understanding on how these things, because the project will thrive, especially in terms of permanence. There's no point of having a, a, a new forest, a restored forest for 40 years and then cut it down. So it means that during those 40 years, the forest must have acquired a value that is way beyond the money they've been getting throughout the, the route. So they have to decide autonomously that that forest is going to stay. So I think these are the interesting challenges that we are facing. Okay, over to you, Dave. So from, from our perspective, we look for maximum imp impact per dollar spent, right? So um, I guess the difficulty here is governments um, play a big role with policy and whether they can make it easy for um, progress in green economies or whether they make it, uh, or whether they become one of the handbrakes to actually uh, progressing that. As you say, one of the barriers to success is the third barrier that you come up with, uh, Mikhail. So uh, that's that's one of these things that we urge our developers to go to is make it easy for us, because when you need so much, uh, so many people involved in actually getting a project off the ground, what what that becomes is a situation where eighty percent of somebody's carbon offset dollar is going to stakeholders along the way and 20% is actually making the impact at the tail end or reaching the communities at the tail end and that is a big problem um, and it has been overcome in many governments where they um, have legislation that supports this Costa Rica for example um, where one of the national goals is to reforest uh, the the country and turn it into, back into a biodiversity hub so all of the legislation points towards how can we uh, encourage this it makes it easy for somebody like Carbon Click to come in and say, right, we know we can buy carbon credits out of Costa Rica. We know exactly where the money goes. We know it's really easy with low consulting costs and so on to be able to get uh, those projects approved, supported, and we reforest it quicker. That's that's the, the one of the biggest challenges. Um, second biggest challenge is in the voluntary carbon markets, <clears throat> getting those uh, standards organisations to sort themselves out. And and they have all agreed to, um, I think three days ago, you had um, SBTI, uh, Science Based Target Initiative, you had the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, you had ICVCM, International Council for the Voluntary Carbon Markets, and so on, all come out saying this is the minimum standard that we're going to accept globally. Um, if you want a, the projects to be aligned, ICVCM, ICRO certified and so on. So then uh, all of the major, the ACR, American Carbon Registry, VERA, Gold Standard, all came out with statements saying they were going to align to that. Now, that's about as useful right now as the, you know, Bill Gates and all those guys standing up saying we've mobilised $58 billion for climate finance in the first three days of COP, because that kind of statement has been happened in the past and what does mobilised mean promise to mobilise or does it mean it's actually sitting in an account somewhere and this so announcements like this in the carbon markets don't mean a lot until we actually see them flow into the standards and that could be years away yeah yeah thank thank you um i think it would be very good to start discussing about the communities and the benefit what the communities are are receiving from the projects because many times community is the center part of the what is going to happen in that uh, area in a longer term so maybe if uh, Jamie and we start with you that um, in which various way you work with the communities and what are the various benefits the communities getting from the from the project in short and long term yeah good um 
Yeah, as I said, the uh, start of the project start with Kubernetes. <laughs> they, they, uh, this is their land. This is their daily life, and they, they need to to have interest in the short, mid, and, and long term of the project. And this is part of of the community engagement at during the design phase of the project. Um, I think you are all aware now that uh, re restoring a forest is not only <laughs> seedling in the nursery and planting trees. That's on your small, really small piece. Um, uh, and the, the livelihood activities are just key. By the way, it's one of our challenge also for investors. Not all of them are aware about this, this uh, important impact for the, the communities. And we still see some of them looking, huh, this livelihood activities, honey production, it's not directly creating emission reductions. And can we remove it from the budget? Then it's a lot, I can understand, but it's a lot of, of um, explanation and education also that we have to do to, uh, to, to the investor. Then how, and it was one of my first discussions with the, the head of the, uh, one of the clan, the clan uh, in, in Ghana. He told to me, yeah, the Mogwa were, were there 30 years ago. We, know, we are all fishermen. We know that with the, the Mogwa tree, we'll have more fish. Uh, it's a nursery for the small fish, and we know that, but it will be in 10 years. How, how can we walk? How can, how can we live uh, from now, the end of the month, until, until uh, year 10? And that's, we, we started uh, to see, yeah, how can we get more, more job and to work especially more with the youth and train the youth of the village to run the nursery? Uh, bring them the capacity to 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 have access to this uh, new job we are creating. That's one short-term uh, benefit. The other one, it's where the the idea during the discussion with the community came with the the honey. It's still it's still a great value chain. It's it's the honey from the mangrove is very valuable. There is a market, local market for that. Then um, um, the the community see that that could be great. Um, uh, activities, companies, creation around the, the honey production. That's that's why we put um, in in our design of the project uh, this uh, uh, honey production uh, activities. And the the more uh, long term is linked with, of course, the the sharing of the of the revenue of the sales of the, of the carbon credits. Um, we set up this uh, community trust fund. It's basically uh, at the end of the year we we sit down again with with the with the committees and see what has been achieved, how the mangrove is is growing, and then which um, uh, part of the carbon revenue can can go into the trust fund and for which activities. And we designed some um, criteria to use for for this money. It could be not directly linked to the forest. It could, it could be with the, the school. For example, the school of these villages on the water three months a year because it's on the wetlands and they need to make some investments to, to just up, up the school. Then the, the money from the, um, this community trust fund can support this type of collective uh, investment. And it shows also um, direct benefit for the community. It's how we, we structured, again, short, mid, and long-term uh, benefits during our discussion with the committee on how we design the project. Okay. And then, uh, Annette, how, how about in your project? Uh, you are working with the communities and what other various benefits for the communities? Yeah, uh, we actually truly believe as a company that, uh, that uh, uh, community is actually the most important, important pillar in our project uh, for it to be sustainable in the long term. We are not in Uganda for, for a few years, we are for a long term. So we need to make sure that we are actually taking care of community, that they are involved and that we are growing together. We are not giving the fish, we are trying to teach how to fish and to grow together. So uh, we are we are um, having like really holistic approach for our community engagement for the creating new jobs as the first one. Um, through our um, biodiversity management practices, together with the local universities, we are opening up the plantations uh, for a training for their students so they can see new opportunities in the market and also exchange knowledge. Uh, with our practices, we also are creating next year piloting community food gardens, meaning we are engaging them a lot in the project operations as well. 
but we also uh, have our own uh, foundational arm. Uh, certain percentage of our revenues will go directly to the our foundation, and we have set uh, some pillars that we really want to uh, promote: is access to education, access to the clean water, solar energy, sustainable agriculture practices. But again. For project to be successful, community needs are the first ones. That's why we are engaging a lot and, and also accessing the community needs assessment because we want to hear from them what they expect, what they need, because maybe we can put the bridge, but maybe they don't need the bridge. So why to do something what is not needed? So in the end of the day, actually, the center is community in a project and how they can be involved how they can see that the project is very useful for them in the future. Because yes, we are establishing new plantations. In the end of the day, that amount of uh, three plantations will also change the environment. And hopefully for a better, we need to make sure that we are creating changes and that's not affecting community in a bad way. And um, yeah, so engagement. And then now over to Mikele, how, how common community benefits in uh, in Guru Mountain project? Uh, very similar, of course, we see the community as the central element. I think one thing that sometimes is uh, not taken enough into account is the way the community receive the benefits. Uh, for a long time in the conservation world, the way you know to deliver benefits to the community was at the village level for things of like public utility like building you know the road the school the dispensary or, or which is of course is good um but uh, the real change also in terms of perception is when the benefits is an individual level. Um, people need to be able to do things that they were not able to do before. Sending their kids to school, buying a motorbike, improving their life. And, and sometimes happen that they have a new clinic, but they are as poor as before. So, of course, if they get sick, they have a cool clinic to go, but they are as poor as before. So uh, needs, a mechanism needs to be wisely designed in order to make sure that the benefits reach individuals. Um, and of course, engagement at all levels. I mean, village, committees, district, region, complete buy-in, and is, is a co-working process. We work together, of course. And, um, and, and of course, there's a lot of emphasis in, in who actually deal with the community. What we always trying to do is to have community people working with the same community. So people from, from the place, I mean, of course, from the country, but from the district, from the village, they share the same language, the same culture, the same. So as much as we can, we, we try to do that. Um, then again, as, as uh, we, we said before, uh, this type of project is something new. I mean, because in the past there were either investments like, you know, a new rice plantation or conservation project. Donors relying on, on what NGOs say, and we are an NGO, so by the way, so I'm also criticizing my own category and, uh, and hoping that what they say is true. Um, I think this is a new, a new area, a new thing, because these projects are linked to a market that hopefully will last very long and will grow and will provide more opportunities. And, uh, and this could trigger a, really a transformational process in the communities and in the way what the project is bringing, a new forest, more protection, biodiversity, a new way of thinking how your landscape will look like, like in terms of mosaic of land uses. So it must be... So I think, again, the real challenge is just not to make sure that we produce what we are supposed to produce in order to, you know, to, to be financially sustainable, but how we really think in terms of vision, the transformation that is going to happen should work with the community. 
So um, going to the payment part, which was very in interesting. The, in Africa, there's estimated that there's uh, 500 million mobile wallets. So basically after China, more mobile wallets in Africa than any uh, anywhere else, basically. And this, of course, gives new opportunities in terms of uh, paying directly to the communities, but it also gives opportunity to show transparently on uh, where the money is, is going. Um, have you in Carbon Click, have you been, Dave, uh, looking into this? Where, how, how does your money flow if you participate on a project? Yeah, yeah we have, and we've integrated, we're, we've even minted carbon onto blockchain in some cases for companies that want to integrate that with wallets. But um, but really, um, the for us, it's more about the distribution to the project owners and the impact that those project owners have in the immediate community around them. Um, and not just immediate community, but you have some, for example, cook stove developers where you have uh, whole whole areas where you have high lung cancer rates in females between 50 to 60 years old um, because of the open fires. Now, so if you can bring in efficient cook stoves or alternatives where they are um, using 25% of the emissions to boil the same amount of water or to cook their meal, there is a carbon element which is measurable and that's what we're buying. But really those social impacts of um, no emissions in the house anymore or, or no particulate in the house anymore, which is causing these high lung cancer rates. This is where we see real um, social and measurable impact. Um, within, within sort of five years time, you start seeing rates start to drop down um, you know that you're having real impact and some of these projects really work. Um, obviously, it's really hard in the first year because it takes a long time to actually see that these impacts are lasting, permanent and and measurable. But um, with some of those proven methodologies and, and proven um, ways of offsetting, like cook stoves, as they mature a, a decade down the track, we know that those are having a real tangible impact. And the developers that we're working with they work locally, so they understand how people culturally cook. It's not just um, pumping a million cook stoves out of a mass production facility. It's actually looking at something that will actually get used on the ground in the way that it was designed and last, you know, a long time. Um, if, if I asked uh, from each of the project developers that, um, uh, uh, like, um, Michele, in, in, uh, in your project, uh, uh, are you paying directly to the communities so into their mobile wallets uh, and how many of a percentage uh, of the community members are receiving money in this way i can't say the percentage now but the uh, answer is yes we we pay directly and uh, um, okay in theory we want we we want to pay them directly into the mobile wallet because it it solves a lot of problems including moving around with some cash in you know could be dangerous for example <laughs> and um, but there's some uh, issues for example in a small village the the little agencies able to give the cash when they ask for the cash after receiving the money in the mobile wallet usually they don't have that capacity yet because the, the amount of transaction that I used to process are very little. So there's like a gap in time between when these start happening and, and when these little agencies in the, in the landscape are really able to, to provide the cash. Because, you know, and we, we are also thinking to help that. So basically to help the, the local agencies to have more cash so they can provide, you know, the money to the people who after receiving the, uh, the funding on the mobile wallet. Um, because, of course, in the day-by-day -day life, most of the exchanges are in cash. Uh, let's say that the, um, the goal is basically to pay under percent of at individual level through mobile wallets. How about the Anet uh, in Uganda? How, how do you distribute uh to the community so first of all uh, our project started this year we have not been distributing funds yet to the communities directly but it will be distributed through mobile wallet either through bank account so 
in in those senses we of course need to be audited we are putting a lot of safety measurements regarding community payments as well in the future so this is regulated by our in-house um operational uh uh, rules as well and as we are transparent and uh, also you know community side foundational side is of course audited annually then uh, that could be through uh, transparent mechanism and also trackable so mobile wallet is is very good we are also looking for the partners who could use a blockchain that's and we we are very pro open source technologies it can provide really good open source uh, registry for information because it's trackable uh, with all the details in it. And uh, yeah, so the regular mechanism banks. Uh, how about da Damien? Is, uh, are the mobile wallets in uh, use in Kana? Not yet, not yet in our project. Um, we, the, there is, uh, I explained this uh, community trust fund is more for, for community-based investment and there is uh, the direct payment for, for the villager. For the moment, we are doing this uh, with cash. Yeah. But why we are thinking about changing to, uh, to wallet payment? For two main reasons. One is logistic. Yeah. It's quite complicated uh, to, to bring out cash and pay cash. And other for tracking of, of, the, of, of the, the, the money and where, where the money is sent. That's, that's the two, two main reasons. It's bring to one of the discussion we uh, used to have with the, actually with the community in, in, in the village, because again, uh, we need a lot of, of discussion with, with the villager to explain this carbon market. It's, it's not, not easy to understand for anybody. And, and in some villages, uh, it, it's also not easy to understand. The way I, I used to is explaining that we are basically creating a, a new value chain. Um, in Ghana, there is a lot of cocoa producer that are producing a second world producer of, of cocoa. Uh, there is this value chain, the producer growing trees, and there is the, the, the cocoa from the trees, a buyer, and the end buyer is eating, buying and eating chocolate. Uh, with with the, the tree we are growing, uh, I use the, the similar, similar explanation. Um, you decided to plant and to value your land with planting trees, it it then it it's a work uh, for you. Um, it's sequestering carbon, and there is some buyer able able to to pay for that. It's a new valuation. It's not tangible. You don't have a cocoa in your hand. <laughs> it's more services that that you are providing, but there is people able to 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 pay and to buy for that. The challenge is not to make another unfair value chain. Cocoa is unfair. It's why farmers are not living in good condition because of that. Uh, when you buy a, a chocolate bar, only six six point six percent is going to the farmer. The, our challenge, as all stakeholder of this new value chain, is not to create another unfair value chain and then how to have a, a fair uh, repartition within all the stakeholders. Everybody are bringing value. Um, investor, uh, project developer, communities, and we need to make sure that it's fair for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, we still have a few minutes time time left. And I, I thought that if each of you would uh, highlight three things, what the market side, the corporates and the investors should look in, in a project uh, shortly. So we can start maybe with Mik Michele and uh, and then uh, continue from there. Three things what the market side should think when they are looking in the project. Okay, uh, of course quality. I mean, the problem is how you define that. Um, I would say, for example, uh, in terms of having a fair value chain, uh, of course, one one re really strong element is how good the, po the policy of the specific country is. And for example, I think in Tanzania, the policy is very good. So it has the local communities at the center. And that's a, a very good starting point. I would say that um, the buyers and also the investors, for example, should look at that. And what what usually happen is 
uh, a mis, I think, mis-evaluation of the specific roles. Because uh, the investor see himself as a fundamental player, which is. But the value of what he is investing compared to the value the, in proportion of what the farmers is putting in the project, which is his land that gives the food for survive. I mean, we should discuss these things. And being fair means that actually, when a policy is, is considered not to be fair for the investors, because it's fair for the communities, usually it's criticized. Because they say, yeah, but you know, this will you know, let investors invest in someone else because, so I think the investors and the buyers should understand this, that we are playing with the, the thing that have the highest value for the people on the ground, way more than some money, is where they base their future, where they come in terms of past and everything they have. So when they decide, okay, let me put some of my land, which usually is like, two acres out of three, so it's not, you know, 2,000 hectares. They are actually taking a very critical decision for their survival, and they are trusting the people who are going there. Usually an investor don't put like 70% of, of ev everything he has, you know, on something. So I think we should think the proportions of the risk that is taken by the different parts thank you and uh, maybe i will because of the timing i'll correct that w one comment on <laughs> that what what is the most important thing to look into I'll, from I'll, the market i'll be quick with my three so the first <laughs> the first first thing um was just the robustness of the project what is the measurement um that's permanence additionality biodiversity social impact the second thing is what is the um, efficiency of the project? So how much money does it take to get from here to the beneficiaries on the ground? Um, you know, that's where I came to the policy and, and so on before. The third thing is, what are the conflicts of interest or um, ulterior motives along the way? So we see in the Amazon, for example, quite a lot of ring-fenced land that is owned by the owned by the same holding companies that also own palm, beef, soy, and so on. And they're going and, you know, carving up big blocks of land, ring fencing it, and claiming avoided deforestation on the bits that you look, they're steep, hilly, rocky. So they're using an artificial baseline to earn credits from something that was never economic to farm anyway. So are you paying more money to those guys that are going to go and buy more land and ultimately deforest? So that's the unintended consequences. That's the third thing. Okay, Annette. Thank you. Yeah, I will be really quick speaking with my lawyer hat on. I would say that, of course, we need to make sure that the, we need to look at the carbon policy. Uh, what's the regulations uh, in the country? I think it's it's actually very, very important uh, to start with. Uh, second of all, uh, how operational team, how effective, how well prepared they are to execute the things that they need to do, uh, how well is established the, the policies. We have been uh, we have been, I have been personally working in a voluntary cover market for six years. And uh, also our, our project, it has a lot of different things, but, but it's actually very crucial how we are uh, resolving the disputes. How is the process? Uh, how is the risks assessments? Are we, uh, are we having like the right uh, framework for, for example, bow tie framework to man measure all risks and take care of them? So these are the things that actually needs to be executed on a very high level if we are approaching large scale projects. So meaning that that needs to be backed by the reporting, by the software. So execution is very important part. And Damien. I would say to the investor, when you are looking at the budget, the spreadsheet, but you like the spreadsheet, and you are looking at uh, all the community activities line, livelihood activities, please 
don't say, huh, it's not ger generating emission reduction. Can we remove or can we lower this line? No, <laughs> this is basically the core of the project. And if we are reducing this uh, piece, uh, basically you are taking more risk that the project will, will fail in a way or another. That's, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I think our time is up. I really hope that the audience got a deeper understanding what is happening on the projects, on uh, how importance of the community and uh, fairness and uh, complexity also what these uh, project developers are facing. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the panelists.